Yes, my father has passed away a few weeks ago. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. It seems like a hard imtihan, a hard test that someone has to go through, losing one of the most beloved people to you on earth. But alhamdulillah, we are at this state of acceptance. There's for sure wisdom in what Allah wills. But there's more than that. So everyone has been wondering what happened and how did it happen. It happened so unexpectedly out of nowhere. He was a fit and healthy man actually. He played tennis the night before. Nothing seemed to be wrong until we received the news. It was a regular day like any other. Me and the brothers were going to go to camping that day. We loaded the car early in the morning while others, including my father, were eating breakfast. So we got on our way. During the ride, it was right before we received a call about the case that we were reading a chapter from a tafsir book called The Words. While we were driving and reading this chapter, towards the end of our reading, my brother who was at home at the time called, but I didn't want to interrupt the reading so I just declined it and finished the reading. Then he called again and told us to come back immediately but didn't tell what exactly happened. He just said, my dad is not good. Meanwhile, my neighbor also texted me saying there are ambulances and police cars in front of the house. On the way back, we're just quiet. There's no sound, no talk in the car. We're just making a dua to Allah to heal him, hoping it's just a food poisoning. But we had no clue what had happened. So we got home, there were still police cars in front of the house. As we stepped in, I knew something was wrong. My beloved mom was seated down in the corner in tears. One police asked us to sit down, then we realized what had happened. They told us that my dad has passed away. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. So that was it. My dad was gone. This dunya turned out to be completely worthless one more time. I wasn't going to see him again. At that moment, the part that we had read in the car about an hour ago just flashed in my mind. Subhanallah, the part was about the occurrence of the hereafter. And it talks about how resurrection is very possible and will certainly happen. Alhamdulillah, Allah prepared our mental strength before that crushing moment by strengthening our faith in the Akhirah. The chapter points to how impossible it is for the resurrection not to happen. It says, is it at all possible that the one who shows us his power and knowledge by giving life to this earth every spring after its death in winter and creating more than a million types of species right in front of our eyes. The one who premises an everlasting paradise and threatens with everlasting hell through divine revelations. The one who makes the human the leader and the most precious member of the creation by ordering the whole universe to serve him. And the one who addresses his human servants without any intermediary. Is it at all possible that the one who does all of these would not bring about the resurrection, restore man back to life and establish the Supreme Court. Is it at all possible that he would not do these or be unable to do so? Of course not. In fact, he already shows us many illustrations of that great resurrection here in this transient world every century, every year and every day. We see every spring that he revives a million different species in less than six weeks. Although the seeds that look identical are all mixed up and lost under the soil, they're made resurrect with utter speed and ultimate quickness. And in less than six weeks, each of them become completely different, beautifully adorned plants that are like copies of the plants from the last spring. Is it at all possible that for the one who does all of these, anything would be hard or that he can't bring back the world or that he can't resurrect the human? If there's a commander who gathers a vast army, army of one million troops, he does it in one day. Someone told you that he's going to gather his soldiers with a trumpet call after they go for a break. Would you say no, he can't? No, of course he can gather them from their break because he has already shown that he can gather armies from nothing in just one day. So what are the truths behind these stories? We mentioned the commander who gathers a vast army. Now think of the great commander of this world who creates and gathers his vast army from nothing. He just calls kun fayakun, be and it is, and all living beings with each of their particles in their bodies form vast armies with utmost discipline, even though he creates such events thousands of times right in front of our eyes. If someone actually looks around with an open mind, he can see many more of the numerous signs, indications and example of resurrection in every season, every age, in the alternation of day and night, in the cycle of water and in the appearance of the clouds in the sky. If the past and the future is also considered, one can witness numerous similes of the gathering and resurrection, as many as centuries and days. After witnessing that many signs, if one says that resurrection is irrational and unacceptable, even he will know that he is just deceiving himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَانْظُرْ إِلَىٰ آثَارِ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ كَيْفَ يُحْيِي الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا إِنَّ ذَلِكَ لَمُحْيِي الْمَوْتَىٰ وَهُوْ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Look upon the signs of God's mercy and see how He gives life to the earth after 
after its death. Surely he is who shall bring life to dead, and he is most capable of everything. There is nothing that makes the gathering of resurrection impossible, but what necessitates is everything. Yes, the glorious one who gives life and death to this earth, as if he is just giving to an animal, who makes the earth like a comfortable house, and make the sun like a light and a heater. The eternal masterhood and embracing sovereignty of such a one cannot be built upon and be restricted to the transitory, impermanent, and deficient affairs of this world. Therefore, he must have another place worthy of him, permanent, stable, and glorious. He actually does have another place that he makes us work for and invites us there. Is it at all possible that Allah who is the maker of this world, the possessor of absolute knowledge and absolute power, should not fulfill his promise and his threat that he proclaims by all of his prophets and is witnessed by all saints, the people whose spirit have passed beyond the physical bounds of the universe and the people of intelligence. Each one of them is a guiding star of mankind. They differ in their lives, methods and paths, but they all affirm and report the same message, that is, the hereafter. After. Is it at all possible that Almighty gives us a promise but doesn't fulfill it, thus display a weakness? Of course not. Of course he is going to create the hereafter. Of course he is going to hold to his promise and create the hereafter. Because it's our need. Because it's everything's need. It's the need of his dominical sovereignty. On the other hand, breaking a promise is a result of impotence. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far from it. So if he broke his promise, that would be contrary to his honorable power and comprehensive knowledge that is displayed on the every part of the universe. Therefore, there is no doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to bring the resurrection and is capable of doing so. Allah's dominical sovereignty necessitates the regathering. The whole creation witnesses this. There is no doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold this promise. There's an ayah in the Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbana innaka jami'un nasi liyawmi la rayba feeh. Inna Allah la yukhlifu al-mi'ad. Our Lord, you will certainly gather the people for the day about which there is no doubt. Surely, Allah does not break his promise. So we gotta understand what death is. What's the truth behind it? If we look at death through the glasses of blasphemical ideologies, from the perspective of human-made worldviews, it is so dark and oppressing like a black hole that absorbs everything in it. It takes whoever and whatever we like in this world in it one by one then eventually it's going to take us to be perished into nothingness that is very hard very hard because it turns whatever pleasure someone can have into suffering if you love your family that gives you pain because you know that they're going to die it makes everything in this world painful if you actually think about it prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says remember often the destroyer of pleasures death if we look at the face of death with the glasses of Iman, from the perspective of Quran, the death becomes a discharge. You know when you get discharged from the military, it's the best day of your life. You are relieved from the hardship of the duty. You go back to your real home and you get to meet back with the people you love. Death for the people of faith is like that too. It means to be relieved from all of the hardships of this world. Whatever you think, your school, your homework, your work, all of that entanglement of this world is gone. Right now if I go to the door and enter into an another room, did I exit or enter? You will say that I exited the room but the people in the other room will say that I entered. Death is like that too. When someone leaves this world, the people say he died and exited this life. But in reality, he entered the real life, the everlasting life. He exited from this narrow, this fleeting life of this world but entered into the real, the stable life of the hereafter, where he will get to meet with the people he loves forever if he's among the righteous. Or let's say a baby is in mother's womb. When his twin leaves the womb and is born into the world, the twin in the womb will say, he left this realm, he is gone. For the baby in the womb, yes, his brother is gone. He left that degree of life. But in reality, he transcended into a higher degree of life, where he can breathe, cry, and meet with his mother who is running around him 24-7. He passes from a narrow, a dense state of life as a fetus to a more extensive more capacious state of life. When a righteous people dies, people say he died, he passed away. But in reality, if Allah is pleased with that person, the place he reaches is way more beautiful, more pleasant and more comfortable than the troublesome life of this world. Just like life for baby was more pleasurable than the womb. For people of faith, death is not an end, it's a start. It's a graduation from the school of dunya. It's the day which you get your reward, your salary for your service, at the presence of Ar-Rahman, the most merciful. There's a term in Turkish language which is used for a person who has passed away. They say he reached the mercy of the ultimate reality. That's what death is for a believer. Reaching the mercy of Allah who is the ultimate reality, the ultimate truth. Mawlana Jalaluddin Rumi refers to death as day of bridal. The people long for the day of bridal, the day of marriage. They want to meet with who they love as soon as possible. 
This is how death is for a Muslim. That's how those great mature individuals have liked and smiled at the face of death. Your Iman, your faith makes you see the good behind everything and how in reality everything is tied to Allah's will. So it gives an incredible peace and tranquility to the believer's heart and makes everything meaningful. Alhamdulillah for the blessing of Iman. Because on the other hand, if there's no faith in Allah and the hereafter, death of a friend or a relative would become a huge devastation. The only way to stop that pain and grief would would be to distract yourself and desanitize your mind and avoid facing the reality. That's basically what people do. Anyways, when they told us that my dad has passed away, we couldn't make sense of losing someone that's this close to us. Later on, that state reminded me of when Prophet Sallallahu son, Ibrahim died at the age of two. At the last moments of his child, Prophet Sallallahu took Ibrahim. He kissed them, he smelled them, he shed tears. Abdurrahman ibn Awf, when he saw the Prophet crying, he said, even you, O Allah's Messenger, the Prophet said, O oh, Ibn Auf, this is mercy. Then he wept more and said, The eyes shed tears and the heart is grief, but we will not say except what pleases our Lord. O oh, Ibrahim, indeed we are grieved by your separation. SubhanAllah. This is what our stance should be against such a loss. The eyes shed tears and the heart is grief, but we will not say except what pleases our Lord. So after we learned about my dad's passing, we were shocked because my dad didn't have any sign of sickness three hours ago when we saw him the last time. We learned that he passed on his chair while working, earning for his family. There's a hadith that recalled to my mind, every servant will be resurrected upon the way that they died. We hope what my father died upon was pleasing to Allah. We believe it was because Rasulullah says, when Allah wants to do good for a person, he enables him to do good deeds until his neighbors are pleased with him before his death. And in another narration, when the Messenger of Allah was with some of his companions, a funeral procession passed and the people praised the deceased. The Prophet said, it has been affirmed to him. Then another funeral procession passed and people spoke badly about the deceased. The Prophet said, it has been affirmed to him. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anh asked Allah's Messenger, what has been affirmed? He replied, you praise this, so paradise have been affirmed to him. And you spoke badly about this, so hell has been affirmed to him. Because you believers are Allah's witnesses on earth. My dad was a quiet man. He didn't talk too much. When he spoke, he would just point the conversation. I would sometimes wonder what was going through his mind. He was very genuine. He wouldn't say or do things that he doesn't believe in. He would know when to speak and when not to. He was very compassionate to his family, very regardful to the nature as well. He would avoid vanity and wastefulness. I would sometimes see him just sitting. No TV, no phone. He would just sit like that and think. He had a profound influence at home, even though he didn't ask much from us. When he said something, he would just do it. When he said something, we would just do it. We had this incredible balance of love and respect in our relationship with him. When we were a child, sometimes at dinner he would just slurp, make noise with his mouth when chewing and eating. When there was silence, we would hear him slurping. And on the dining table, me and my siblings would just look at each other and we would laugh at him. And he would act like he doesn't know what we were laughing at. We, just like any other child, would not eat as much as our parents want us to eat. So after he passed away, I learned that he was slurping intentionally on the dining table to make us appetize so we eat more because hearing someone slurp subconsciously increases one's desire to eat and for our laughing he wouldn't react at all I'm pretty sure he knew we were laughing at him but he probably also enjoyed that we were having fun I have never heard him yell at my mother not once in my life when the argument intensified and my mom got mad he would just keep quiet and wouldn't try to come out on top after he passed away I sat and thought to myself what benefit did he have to people and what harm did he have I couldn't find any harm he had to any living so Subhanallah. But he was supporting and contributing to life of many in numerous ways. May Allah have mercy on him and grant him the highest Jannah. Ameen. Now he's dead, but he is dead in terms of his sins. He can't sin anymore. His book of sins is closed. But inshallah, his book of good deed is going to remain open through us, his children, through the knowledge he thought, and through the sadaqa jariya he gave out. This is going to happen to each one of us. Each one of you guys who watch this video. Every soul will taste death. Then to us you will be returned. This is the biggest truth, the most certain thing in life. None of the plans we make is 100% certain, but death is. It awaits for us. We don't have the option to stay here in this world forever. We can't dodge death by shutting our eyes. There's departure for everyone and for some of us it might be 50 years but it's eventually going to come and catch each one of us this way or that way. It caught my dad at the most unexpected moment. 
As I said, it was perfectly regular day. When we were preparing to leave, they were eating breakfast together like any other day. After we left, they finished the breakfast, everyone went on their duties, and my dad went to his room to do his work. After 15-20 minutes, when my mom entered the room to take something, she saw him leaning his head on his chest so like this as if he was sleeping. She thought to herself that he would never fall asleep while working. She called him, no response. He had already passed away, turned over his spirit to his Rabb. Whatever they tried to do, they couldn't avoid the Qadr that Allah has assigned for my dad. They couldn't save him. Who knew? Who knew that was his last day on earth? Death is unknown. It can happen any moment. Ali radiallahu an says, people are asleep. They wake up when they die. So before the death arrives and wakes us up from this lifelong sleep, we should wake up and work towards what's after death because the deal beyond the grave is far more crucial than the deal before the grave. When they bury us into that grave, we won't have a chance to turn back and live like there's a death and the day which we are turned back to Allah Azza wa Jal. So before it's too late, we should remind ourselves of death and set up our actions, our choices, the places we go, the people we talk to, the things we watch, the occupations we spend time for with the awareness that there's death one day. There's no doubt that youth will depart. It will give its place to old age and death. Death. This is as certain as summer giving its place to autumn and winter, and day changing into evening and night. If the youth and life is spent on good works with chastity, within the bounds of path drawn by prophets, it will inshallah gain the person an immortal youth. If a healthy, mature seed is planted, it will give beautiful trees. But if a distorted seed is planted, it will just wither. If we stay healthy and protect our fitrah and live in the way Allah wants us to live, then inshallah, our seed is going to give hundreds of trees in the akhirah. But if we distort our nature, our fitrah and go vice, then we're going to be wasting our seed to perish into nothing and just yield pain to us. Allah created this universe in a continuously alternating fashion as a mercy. In this testing ground, He continuously alternates all generations with new ones and therefore display his permanency. He gives lessons to thousands of others by creating death of one. So let's take a step and accept this chance that he has given to us to actually take a lesson and make a change in our lives in a way that would please him. If you're not praying five times a day, go ahead and make your intention. Seek Allah's help and take a step and take this chance to start your daily prayers inshallah. Or if you are having a hardship covering yourself properly, go ahead and make your intention now and take that step towards Allah. Isn't it time for you to make a tawbah, a repentance for the sin that you're committing and ask Allah to give you something better? Allah says in a hadith Qudsi, whoever draws close to me by the length of a hand, I will draw close to him by the length of an arm. Whoever draws close to me by the length of an arm, I will draw close to him by the length of a fathom. Whoever comes to me walking, I will come to him running. Please keep us and my father in your duas. See you in the next video inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.